Okay, everybody. Good afternoon. The topic of whether Bernie Sanders can still win the Democratic nomination is obviously one being widely discussed at the moment, and there are a number of ways to answer that question. First of all, yeah, he could still win. There could be a seismic shift in the race. There could be some completely unforeseen event that occurs. Remember, we're dealing with two candidates, leaving aside Tulsi for the time being. We're dealing with two candidates who are in their upper 70s and have a history of health issues. So anything could happen, but what would need to happen is a relatively seismic shift in the race because what the results from Super Tuesday, also known as Stupid Tuesday, demonstrated was that in the past week or maybe a little bit more there has been just such a rapid shift in public opinion that it's almost i believe without precedent in at least modern electoral history so the shift that occurred a few days before the South Carolina primary, I, I would actually sort of identify it as after the Nevada caucus leading up to Super or Stupid Tuesday was just an incredibly volatile shift in American voter sentiment on an order that I really doubt we've ever seen before. Now, this is going to be studied and analyzed and commented upon endlessly, maybe for years to come, by political scientists and others. Um, but at least my preliminary impression, and there's a lot of data to consume here. I'm not saying I've consumed all of it, but, you know, this is sort of what I do, so I have consumed a lot. All of that data really indicates that something hugely dramatic happened in a very short span of time. Now, we know, obviously, that there were these strategic dropouts of the other candidates who are so-called moderates, which is, as I've mentioned before, a designation that I despise because it is so incredibly reductive. And there are other factors that, of course, probably played some role. I have no idea, aside from aimless speculation as to what the effect of this whole coronavirus thing might have been. It's possible, I guess, that the specter of a major pandemic sort of activates a conservative impulse in voters and makes them go for what they perceive the safe choice to be, and they largely perceive it to be Biden, even though I don't even think that's necessarily true, given his very obviously diminishing cognitive capacities given his problems regarding Ukraine and his dealings there with respect to his son. That was the focal point of the impeachment proceedings and so on and so forth. However, you do have to acknowledge that Biden, at least in head-to-head -head matchups with Trump, has performed, generally speaking, better than Bernie. And there's an interesting finding today in a poll, and by the way, I'm sort of glad that I'm not doing this on my phone, meaning I'm streaming from my phone, because it sort of frees me up to use my computer to reference things. And I know you don't care about that, but I'm killing time as I find the data nugget that I wanted to bring up. Okay, so there is a new CNN poll today. And please don't dispute the mythology of polls with me. You can dispute them somewhere else. I'm not saying all polls are perfect. I'm not saying that they need to be taken as gospel. But I find some of the paranoia about the nature of polls to be foolish. Guess what? Biden was leading in the polls for most of 2019. And look at what happened, okay? So uh, in the CNN poll, Biden has a plus three net favorability rating among all voters. Whereas 
this time in the 2016 cycle, Hillary Clinton's net favorability was negative 15. And now Bernie's favorability re rating is negative 14. So Bernie's image among voters has gotten substantially worse. Whereas Biden's, Biden's is relatively good. So I'm not going to write off Biden potentially being Trump. And I'm not going to necessarily reject out of hand that the voters who have decided that they want to vote for Biden because they think he's the most electable candidate are necessarily wrong. I don't have a time machine. I can't go to, go to November and tell you what happens in a election matchup, matchup between Bernie and Trump. Who knows? I mean, sorry, with between Biden and Trump. Who knows? Hey, by the way, the economy seems to be crashing at the moment. I mean, I'm not an expert in this stuff, but it really looks quite bad from what I'm gleaning. You have the coronavirus seeming to be spreading fairly rapidly in the United States. I just saw that the executive director of the Port Authority, which basically runs most of the um, interstate connections between New York and New Jersey, he has coronavirus. And by the way, he also has authority over the airports in the region. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not going to pretend like I have any special insight into how to cover or talk about this coronavirus subject. You know, I hope that it's alarmism, but I, I truly don't know. And I don't know what effect that would have on voter behavior necessarily. Um, but at least the short-term prognosis for the economy is not looking particularly good, which seems to be the reason why Trump is systematically downplaying the severity of the coronavirus with crazy tweets. And, you know, I'm not somebody who necessarily dwells all that much on Trump's tweets, I think the fixation on them has caused a lot of people to be driven insane. But today, I mean, he's like, he's going wild on Twitter saying that this is just like the common flu and blah, 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 which I don't think is accurate. Again, I'm not a public health expert, but it seems like Trump is talking a lot of malarkey at the moment. And I don't know what effect that's going to have on the markets, etc. But the point is, I see a lot of people proclaiming with absolute certainty that Joe Biden would lose to Donald Trump. You don't know that. I don't know that. Nobody knows that. I remember at this point in 2016, everybody was insisting to me that there was zero chance that Donald Trump could win the election. I know retrospectively, a lot of people like to claim that they were believers in Trump's ability to win the 2016 election, but the vast, vast majority of those people are lying. They're trying to make themselves seem smart after the fact when it was 100% conventional wisdom that Trump had almost no chance. Um, and so, you know, I have a similar mindset as to what could transpire in 2020. Look, the Democratic Party electorate is extremely mobilized right now. Look at some of these figures from the early primary states. I'll give you just one example here. The number of votes cast in the Texas Democratic Party increased by 122% between 2016 and 2020. Did you hear that? 122% more people voted in the 2020 Democratic primary than the 2016 Democratic primary. So the nature and size of these electorates has just shifted radically over the span of just four years. And so what implications does that, does that have for the general election? Well, one of the harbingers of Hillary's weakness in 2016 was that turnout in the Democratic primaries was very low. 
And that is sort of an uh, omen for voter interest. I've said this many times, but you have to remember, 2018 saw the highest turnout for any midterm election in the United States since 1914, in over 100 years. So huge segments of the electorate are extremely politicized, and you might even say radicalized. The problem for Bernie is they're not radicalized toward achieving democratic socialism. They're radicalized in reaction to Trump. And if you're radicalizing simply out of an averse reaction to Trump, there's no necessary reason why that should result in a desire for big structural change, as Elizabeth Warren likes to talk about, a desire for democratic socialism, as Bernie talks about, a desire for pretty much anything except removing Trump. So that is the framework in which most democratic primary voters appear to be operating at the moment. What is the lesson of this cycle so far? Well, it's that most Democratic primary voters have no problem with the Democratic Party institutionally. They're not walking around with these deep-seated animosities and disaffections toward the institutional Democratic Party. They, they like the Democratic Party. They hold it in high regard. All the central figures in the Democratic Party are people that they generally like. Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie, even Bernie Sanders they like. Bernie Sanders has high favorability ratings in the Democratic Party. So there's not this sort of massive disenchantment with the Democratic Party as such. It's just when that sort of gets filtered into voter behavior, they're taking the most quote-unquote conservative option. Because... That's kind of what tends to happen when the entire political debate is framed around removing the incumbent president. That's why uh, John Kerry won in 2004. I was still a teenager following that at the time, but, you know, it's a similar dynamic. There was huge amounts of resentment and animosity toward Bush, and Democrats just wanted the guy who seemed like they could get him out. They were wrong, but when you have people thinking in these terms... it doesn't lend itself to a rational calculation necessarily, especially because of the hysteria that's been fomented around Trump, whether it's the Russia stuff, impeachment, proclamations about concentration camps being established in the United States, this idea that Trump is destroying democracy or he's uh, you know, forcing an authoritarian takeover of all democratic institutions, that he's a violently rabid racist, all of this sort of congeals into a response that is conservative in terms of the scope in which people think about what is achievable politically. Bernie expanded the scope of what people thought was achievable politically in 2016 because he was providing this alternative to just the establishment standard affair style of democratic politics. And people were willing to entertain that at greater rates in 2016, I think, because it wasn't as if it seemed like we were in the midst of this crisis constantly. We had eight years of a Democratic president. People were willing to broaden their horizons. And that's just not the dynamic now. So can Bernie win? Okay, yeah, I guess he could still win. But you know what? He, I would think, almost certainly would have to... So Okay, so if the current trajectory continues, if there's no seismic event that changes the whole nature of the race, if it just sort of keeps muddling on as it is now, I would think that Bernie would have to win Michigan tomorrow in order to be viable. Okay, Michigan is sort of central to the premise behind Bernie's case for his electability. <coughs> it's a state that Democrats have sort of tailored their entire public messaging 
since 2016, specifically in order to win in 2020, because it, of course, voted for Trump. And if Bernie can't win Michigan, then I don't see how that electability argument could be revived. Now, people tell me that the polls failed to predict that Bernie would win the Michigan primary in 2016. That is true. There was a huge polling error in the 2016 Michigan Democratic primary. But there are reasons to believe that there would not be comparable error now. And the latest polls show Biden ahead by Bernie, ahead of Bernie in Michigan by 24 points. This is a poll that came out today from the Detroit Free Press. First of all, Biden is clearly on an upward trajectory nationwide. That's why he did so much better among people who decided at the last minute who they were going to vote for on Super Tuesday or Stupid Tuesday. And we have a, even since Super, Super Tuesday, there's been a huge amount of coalescence around Biden. Kamala Harris endorsed him yesterday. Cory Booker endorsed him today. I'm sure there have been other endorsements probably since I just started this video that also demonstrate this rapid establishment coalescence. Whereas in 2016, it was just sort of different. Hillary seemed like she had been anointed the winner from the very beginning. So she had all her endorsements extremely early on. And then her support sort of gradually eroded. Whereas for Biden, now because he had been not taken seriously enough for quite a while, the momentum, to use a cliche, that he's receiving just in the past week or so has a sort of air of freshness about it. It's like, oh, wow, Joe came back from the dead. All these people now just finally came to their senses and realized that Joe Biden is the best candidate. Um, so it's just a little bit different. And in 2016, there, of course, were two primaries for each party. Um, and the people who have, might have otherwise have voted in the Republican primary are now voting, a portion of them are voting in the Democratic primary, and they are the small but some, somewhat significant uh, p uh, portion of never Trump type people, moderate Republicans, people who don't like Trump's managerial uh, capacities. And they're voting in the Democratic primary, and they're voting either for um, Bloomberg or Trump or a uh, sorry, Bloomberg or Biden on Super Tuesday, and now I would assume that those people are just going to go straight to Biden. Um, one thing that the... Uh, oh, sorry, one second. I'm just looking something up here. So the, the, the polls in Michigan in 2016... They, they didn't capture a late break toward Bernie. That's why the polls had a huge error. But all signs sh seem to indicate that everything is breaking for Biden. There's no like indication that there's a late break to Bernie right now. In fact, everything is trending in the opposite direction. Um, and, you know, the, the polls did not adequately pick up on the white working class rural support that Bernie had in 2016. And Biden has eaten majorly into those margins far beyond what Hillary did. The white working class vote did not like Hillary in 2016, but they're at least mar much marginally mu uh, more content with Biden. And, um, you know, the, I guess the one X factor is whether black voters in the Midwest vote significantly differently than black voters in the South. Now, I think that's probable. I think black voters in the South were always the absolute worst demographic for Bernie, especially older black voters. So I, th I would assume that he would actually get more support in Michigan among black voters than he has in the South, or even the mid-Atlantic, if you're going to count like Virginia. Um, but is that enough to make up for Bernie in Michigan, at least according to the latest poll? being woefully behind with all older voters to the point that it does not seem like that deficit could possibly be surmountable.
Um, where is that figure? Okay, so in the in the new Michigan poll from the Detroit Free Press, again, I'm not saying you have to believe every poll. I'm saying take all this with a grain of salt, okay? But this is actually consistent with trends nationwide, so. And we can learn that by the actual voting data that has already occurred. In Michigan, Biden is ahead of Bernie among voters age 50 and over by 51 points. Let me restate that. Biden is beating Bernie among voters age 50 and over by 51 percentage points. Now, people can beg Elizabeth Warren to, inter to or endorse at the last minute, although I doubt she will. I actually think Elizabeth Warren ha would have more leverage with Joe Biden, which seems counterintuitive. But if Elizabeth Warren can give sort of progressive legitimacy to Biden, then that's actually an asset for him. That's sort of a new faction of voters that he could reach into. Whereas Elizabeth Warren can't offer Bernie Sanders any quote-unquote progressive legitimacy. So if she's sort of biding her time here to exert maximum leverage over the Democratic Party, then she's doing a rational thing by not endorsing Bernie right now. So enough of the begging, enough of the pleading. And even if she were to endorse at the last minute like tonight, it wouldn't even make that much of a difference, I don't think. It's too late. Um, so, you know what? I don't want to be super defeatist. Everybody who's watching this knows that I prefer Bernie on the substance to Biden by a huge long shot. But I'm also not going to be one of these, I'm sorry to say, Bernie propagandist types who only puts out the most positive spin on everything, who has this paranoid outlook where everything has to be rigged at all times. Is there rigging? Yeah. But the establishment rigging stuff isn't like a conspiracy necessarily. It's just what they do. It's how they exert power. And by rig rigging is like, I, I would differentiate rigging from establishment coalescence. 2016 primaries were rigged against Bernie. They hid debates in the dead of night on the weekends. The superdelegates lined up for uh, Hillary way ahead of time to the point that when they listed the delegate totals, they would include superdelegates and made it seem falsely like Bernie was way behind. Um, Bernie was not getting a, 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 the amount of press coverage early on that he warranted in 2016. None of that's been true this time. Bernie has had every opportunity in the world to expand his coalition, and you know what? It's not working. You know, one thing that I mentioned yesterday... See, and I was serious about it, is what harm would it do for Bernie to wear an American flag pin? Does that sound silly? Perhaps. But the Bernie campaign and the online, and the sort of progressive activist world are always super eager to make empty symbolic gestures to voters around issues of race, gender, identity, and so forth. And yet... They have no tolerance with acquiescing to what is really a minor but potentially significant symbolic gesture just to make Bernie seem like a more mainstream patriotic politician. I don't think Bernie hates America. I think Bernie actually likes America. He likes the aspect of Amer America around like Americana, American culture. He obviously has a great affinity for huge swaths of the American people. So why not adopt some of the iconography around America and sort of frame your vision of democratic socialism around something that kind of fulfills the best aspirations of the American people or something? But you can't do that because a lot of left-wing activists, I'm sorry to say, have a deep hatred of America. And not just American foreign policy, which I also dislike immensely. Not just the American political system, which I also have huge amounts of criticisms of. Not just sort of artificial, corporatized culture, which I also am not any fan of in the slightest, but they have some, they, they sort of like reject America writ large. They just don't like America. And if you don't believe me, you've never interacted with left-wing activists. It's absolutely true. I'm not saying all of them, but a very mobilized and vocal segment of American left-wing activists feel this way about their own country. And when you pick 
surrogates to represent your campaign who espouse that mindset, you're going to wonder why you're not making more inroads with sort of just normal Democrats? Really? They had a surrogate at the Bernie rally in, I believe it was Michigan on Saturday, who was saying, oh yeah, racism and capitalism are two sides of the same coin. That language might really excite highly energized portions of activists who spend a lot of time on Twitter, but that language is alien to the, the huge, to, to the vast majority of the country. And they don't get it. So there will be a lot of recriminations here. I have a lot of opinions. Um, and maybe I'll be proven dead wrong. Maybe he will win Michigan tomorrow. I have, all I can do is sort of give you my best sense of things. All right, let me uh, scan through and see if there are super chats I may have missed here. Wow, there don't appear to be. I'm extremely offended. Um, all right. I'll leave it there for now. Have a good day. Maybe I'll do another video if I feel moved to tonight. But probably not. All right, bye-bye.